Good afternoon. Welcome to Storytelling Live and the Mary B. Martin Storytelling Hall at the International Storytelling Center. We're happy to have you all here with us this afternoon. Our Teller and Residence program runs for 26 weeks through the end of October and features a different storyteller each week. We're so thankful for our program sponsors, Crest One Health and ECU, and I hope that you'll take a moment to look inside your program this afternoon. Here you will find a list of logos of our funding partners, our media sponsors, and the names of all of our terrific friends of Storytelling Live as well. Our signature event, the National Storytelling Festival, takes place here in downtown Jonesboro the first school weekend in October. I hope that many of you are planning to come back and be with us. Please take the opportunity while you're here today to pick up a copy of our main promotional brochure. It will give you all the details surrounding this year's festival. Emergency exits are right behind you to your left and to your right. We remind you that no photography, videography, or other recording is allowed during the performance. And we'll pause for just a moment and ask you to please silence those cell phones for us. And we thank you so much for your help with that. A couple of notes for you before we get started today. I did want to remind you that we do have the final uh, segment in our children's programming series for the summer. Angela Lloyd will be our children in residence next week. And on Saturday, August the 8th at 1030 in the Scurry Room, she will be conducting a children's performance for us. It's targeted at children ages 6 to 10. But it's for a general family audience, so we hope that you will help us spread the news about that. All seats are $5. Also, we do want to welcome back for the final week. Our uh, student storytelling students from ETSU are with us today, uh, along with their instructor, uh, David Novak. We can give them a hand. <laughs> well, as you know, our children residence this week is Megan Wells, who has come to us from Illinois. Megan is well known for her one woman shows of literary tales and myths. She's been featured at the National Storytelling Festival, and this has been her first visit to our Teller and Residence series, and we're so happy to have her with us in Jonesboro this week. I did want to give you one note regarding the program today. As I think you all know, this is going to be um, an 80 minute program. So, due to that and the fact that Megan needs to get back in for a topic session with our students today, her uh, meet and greet with the audience members will be just very short. So we want you to be able to speak to her, but we hope that you'll hold those comments to a minimum, please. So now let's officially welcome Megan Wilson. Thank you. When's the last time you read your Homer? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody in Homer's day read Homer. Last week. Because it was last week. Homer Simpson. <laughs> <laughs> now there is a political nod. It's a very long old story, and we will tell it in a, a shorter, newer way. And without any fuss and ado, I'll just get started. Homer's books were ten books long to get this war done in. We have 80 minutes. <laughs> long, long ago, when ships were powered by men with oars, and swords were made of bronze and war helmets of boar and leather, all history, all news, was carried by word of mouth, from mouth to ear, like gossip. And the stories told then tell of a war between the Greeks and the Trojans that destroyed the great crown jewel city of Troy. Troy was nestled in the northeast corner of the Aegean Sea, at the mouth to the Black Sea, completely surrounded by an impenetrable wall a city of towers nestled in the foothill of Mount Ida, looking down upon the Aegean, controlling the mouth to the Black Sea and all the trade. Busy, happy Troy was the mistress of trade through the Aegean Sea and the goading envy of the Greeks. Homer says that that war lasted for 10 years and was caused by a woman. Helen of Sparta, 
the most beautiful woman of the time. The face that launched a thousand ships. I wonder what it was like to live behind a face like that. <laughs> Sparta, southern Greece, an inland place, three miles from its harbor. King Dendarius brought his wife, Queen Leda, and their four children, the quadruplets, down to the harbor for the day. The king to inspect his fleet of ships, and the mother to take the children to the beach. Cloudless sky, blue sea, beaching waves. The royal tent nestled like a purple flower against the scrubby rocks and cliff, and the three children, the two boys and the one daughter, Polydeuces, Castor, and Clytemnestra, all walked freely in that sun-feathered surf. Only Helen was stuck with her mother in the tent. She leaned out of the flaps to watch. Helen, 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 come away from the tent. The, the sun of reflects Apollo's rays and will stain your skin. Mother, you sit on me like a hen upon an unhatched egg. Whose curse is this, that I should be so pale? Not a curse, Helen, a blessing. Why would you want to stain so rare a tapestry? I do not care about my face, but you must. Why must I? Because you were born for a marriage of power. Is that my fault? Not your fault, your fate. Helen, it's time. And the mother shooed all the servants from the tent for this confession. Helen. I did not have quadruplets. I have two sets of twins. You and Polydeuces were conceived on the banks of a pond, a reedy pond, deep into the oak grove. Yes, mother? Tyndarius? No, no, no. Not King Tyndarius. When I first arrived from Athens to marry the king, the customs here are so strange among the women, as well you know. In Athens we practice monogamy, but here in Sparta they breed warriors, so a man is happy when his wife is shared. I was not. And so I would go for long walks there in the oak grove, where I found this secret pond. And on the pond, a pair of swans, a mated pair of swans. I went every day that first spring. Tyndarius asked me not to go, so I went when he wasn't looking. <laughs> well, on the first full summer moon, another swan appeared. Huge, male. The first couple grew agitated. The, the husband honked and flapped his wings at the intruder, but that swan was not interested in the swan's wife. Rather, he swam all the way across that pond to me. Oh, Helen, he was so beautiful. His eyes were black. His beak was black. His feathers were white upon he opened his wings and he fanned me. Well, when we joined, I did not know if I was a swan or he were a man. We were fast and slow and fierce and tender and wanting and spent. And when we were complete, he flew away. And I noticed that the swans on the pond had been watching us. Helen was watching her mother. Her mother's skin, ooh, dark. And the hair, dark. Earth, nuts, bark. Helen pulled the flaxen wave 
of her own long hair, letting it fall, fall, fall upon a pale, smooth arm. Mother, I am a swan. <laughs> yes, my dear. Now, they say that King Darius was not angry at his wife, Queen Leda, for her pond adventure because he was the beneficiary that very same night when Queen Leda returned from that pond with swan feathers wild in her hair and taught her husband what she had discovered. Ah. One night, two lovers, four children, from the human marriage, Tyndarius and Leda, came Castor and Clytemnester, but from the egg seeded by divinity, dark Polydeuces and pale Helen, the princess of Sparta, who lay awake all that night, pondering the nature of swans. Sparta, Sparta, prepare the messenger came running from the harbor into the palace. Uh, King Theseus comes, King Theseus' ship has come from Athens. King Theseus, the mightiest hero of the age, unmarried, come to a Spartan palace with two unmarried daughters. Queen Leda went to the altar, and she arranged swan feathers to Aphrodite, the goddess of love and beauty. Theseus is a fine choice for my fair Helen. At the feast that night, King Theseus sat upon a divan with his best friend, King Prometheus of Larissa. Why, companions sense you. The Athenians whispered that they were like an old married couple, never apart. Even here at the feast, Prithus leaned into Theseus, eyeing the beautiful Queen Liga. Uh, she did it with a swan, with <laughs> Zeus, <laughs> with Zeus as a swan. Did she like it? Who? Lita. Did she like it with Zeus as a swan? Well, of course she did. It's Zeus, isn't it? <laughs> he looked down to his wine bowl, nestled there in his belly, gone soft. Ah, peace is boring. Mm, Theseus. You need an heir. Mm? A marriage with Sparta would be good for Athens. Oh, let the bastards earn the throne as I did, said Theseus as he stood, for the daughters were coming into the room. And Queen Leda brought her Helen into her lap and undid her braids to arrange those soft curls upon the young swan's breasts. Theseus stole into Helen's chamber that very night. Marriage was not his intent. He stole her away like a pirate on his ship. Was Helen willing or unwilling? Or unwillingly willing? She was 15, and Theseus was the greatest mortal hero of the age. His black hair still long to his shoulders, framed by the braids of conquest. There followed a wedding, but it wasn't Helen's. Month after month after month, Queen Leda waited for news of some betrothal from Theseus and Helen, and nothing came, and so Clytemnestra was made a match. Oh, she buckled at the knees when she saw her betrothed. She was married to the high king of southern Greece, Agamemnon, the square-jawed ruler. 
It was passion and politics in equal measure, and that wedding brought all of Greece, her kings and her warriors and her politicians, everybody but Theseus. <coughs> Theseus did not come to the wedding with Helen draped on his arm elegantly as his bride or his future bride. All the guests whispered, and Queen Leda spoke to her husband that night in their chambers. They say, they say that Theseus has abandoned Helen, that he has gone with Perithous now to the underworld. But to, to fetch up the queen of the underworld, is Helen not enough? Well, I told you the man was married to adventure and would have no woman to wife. I know. Hmm. But was it wrong to hope? Who will be strong enough? Oh, not the key. I'll send the boys. Castor and Polydeuces were sent to Athens to retrieve their sister with 300 warriors muscling their ships all the way. When they arrived, the Athenians had no idea who they were talking about. Helen, Helen, Helen who? Theseus had hid Helen from all, but they found her at last, for beauty will not be hid. She was there with old Aethra, Theseus's mother. And when Polydeuces saw her, his sister, she was much changed. She was pink-cheeked, and she ran into the sun-blessed day threw her arms about her brother, whose blood immediately called to the hunt. He, sister, <laughs> he said as if to remind himself, and <laughs> took some distance. <laughs> Why do you look at me like that, Polydeuces? Um, mm, he was not the only one looking. All the 300 hungry warriors were looking too. Helen of Sparta, gather who and what you love. This place is destined for revenge upon Theseus. Aphidne was pummeled, sacked, gutted. Old Aethra and Helen were carried home with the booty in the belly of the ship. I thought that Theseus loved me. Oh, Helen, love has nothing to do with it. But no, 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 you cannot. Love does not uproot what the fates plant at birth. My son Theseus was born for adventure. Loving you awakened in him the desire to seek more of it. Oh, you held him longer than most. Content yourself with that, Helen, Helen. Do not be a woman withered upon the futile hope of change. <laughs> Helen came home, and the dogs of Greece would be held back no more. The suitors came from every corner. Relying upon King Dentarius's hospitality, they paced and they fed and they drank and they howled and Helen kept to her rooms. Peeking out now and again for the one. That one. With the red hair. For the days grew longer and longer, and Tyndarius made no decision, and the drunk suitors grew more and more pressing until finally among them, one not so taken by Helen's face, holding aside Odysseus, the king of Ithaca, the one in the other book. <laughs> Well, then, Darius, in truth, your niece Penelope pleases my eye more than Helen. Grant me Penelope for my wife, and I will give you a way around these kings and fools. Uh, I, I would gladly do so. 
Now, here's what you do. Before you announce the husband and stir all the suitors to war, you must make all of them, each and every one, take an oath. They must all vow for the couple's protection, to protect Helen should she be stolen from the husband. Oh, well, I see where you're going, Odysseus, but in Sparta, we share our wives. We breed warriors in Sparta. And yes, yes, I know Tiberius, and you are Helen's father, but look at her. Would you share her if she were yours? It was decided. Well, they slaughtered a horse, and each of the suitors stood sacred upon a bloody part and vowed protection for the unnamed couple, which then was named Menelaus of Mycenae, the one with the red hair. Well, no one was surprised. Menelaus was Agamemnon's brother, Clytemnestra's husband, two sisters to two brothers, a strong alliance between the two most powerful cities of Greece. Helen went to that bedchamber, not entirely unwilling. Besides, I can think on Theseus if I need to. But the moment she stepped toward the bed, the moonlight broke through the window, kissing Helen's beauty aglow. And Menelaus, mm, tethered to his hungry eyes, bounded too fast and, and took her, his hands un, unmindful, his his beard chafing, his moans solo. All Helen could hear in her mind was old Aether's advice, do not hope for change. Daughter Hermione was born 270 days after that marriage bed. Helen counted every day. And Menelaus growled for her return to his bed. But she took to the nursery. Protection as formidable as a wall around Troy. And so Menelaus traveled for his brother Agamemnon. His ship buying brother Agamemnon sent Menelaus to all the coastal kingdoms. And when he returned a year later, they tried again. But nobody had told Menelaus what to change. So that rough sea prowess sprouted another son, and then another year of travel, and then another son, and another travel, and at last, Menelaus mm, bent his knees to an oracle. God Apollo, Driver of the sun chariot, master of music and art and prophecy. I am a man of war, but Helen wields such strange weapons. Yet I will not be a slave to her unbridled will. Tell me what I must do to own my wife. The answer was this. Menelaus must travel to Troy to make great sacrifices there at the Promethean Temple, outside of the Trojan War. And so Menelaus traveled again. He gave no words to his wife when he left. He thought she didn't want any. Helen thought he had none to give her. And her mother persuaded her to come to the tapestry room to join the women in the weaving soothes these hard feelings, my daughter. In Troy, Menelaus made great sacrifices there at the Promethean Temple. And the answer of the oracle came strange. The fire that burns too hot 
empties the vessel. A slower flame brings the boil that melts all. <laughs> Menelaus could not penetrate this oracular advice, so he traveled among the Trojan women and took comfort in a few until he met his match. Where Helen was straight, this Trojan woman was round. Where Helen was fair, this woman was dark. And where Helen was new, this woman was experienced. Menelaus, Menelaus, slow down, slow, slow down. What, 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 you know, a woman is water, she's not fire. He sat up at that. What? A woman is water, Menelaus. Not fire. You go too fast. And then he understood. And she said to him, whose face is it you see when you close your eyes like that? Helen's. Oh, go home. <laughs> so Menelaus made for home. Gathering his ship at the Trojan harbor, his heart flipping between regret and hope, hastening his men, when one of the men called out and pointed up to the cliff face, look there, Menelaus, look, look, it's, it's Prince Paris. Cannot be. They are all competing in the early games. No, I am sure. It is the second born son of Troy, Prince Paris. Look at his bow. And he looked again, and Menelaus could see it. Was the great bow, the famous bow. And sure enough, maybe the famous prince. And he called out, Prince Paris, what brings you to the harbor? And he slipped down, sure footed as a goat, until the two were eye to eye. Paris just looked at Menelaus for a long time to read him there. And then he spoke. I grew up in the hills, abandoned by my family, and was brought back now to brothers who know me not. Hector, the firstborn, Diphobus, treacherous. Sometimes, said Menelaus, Sometimes a man needs a little bit of distance. Come aboard my ship. I head for home. And that is how Menelaus did quite unknowingly lead a lion home. When the ship docked at Sparta, Paris jumped ship and ran off into the wild. They had not spread the mountain out of him yet, he said to his men, who all laughed. Paris, the ship will be ready for you when you are healed and long for home. And then, oh, the air held its breath to watch Menelaus court his wife. At their first meeting, she crossed her arms and scowled at him. Menelaus held his tongue and let his gifts do the talking. Mm, brooches and, and oils for the bath, and jewels for the hair. He did not ask her to his bed that night. In the morning, she loosed the children on him, and he <laughs> balked. <laughs> but by nightfall, you know, they were talking and walking and safe enough to pull at his red beard. Again, he slept alone. On the third twilight, she watched his eyes at the meal and afterwards found herself drinking wine with him in the great hall. 
they almost laughed. The very next night, he arranged with the mothers, Lida and old Aethra, to arrange fresh flower petals in Helen's bed chamber. And again, he did not call her to his bed. The next night, she called for him. He came in. He sat next to her there on the bed. He asked her how she was. She answered. He asked more. She answered. He just let her talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. And, talk. and, talk. and, and, and when he was sure she was done talking, he took her palm and kissed it. And left the bedchamber. She sent for him again the next night, but he was delayed for the Greeks and Trojans practice hospitality. And so everyone had come to welcome Menelaus home and to ask him a thousand questions about Troy and that Trojan bull. And Menelaus told them everything that he could while he tried so hard to get out from that. And when he got to the bedchamber, she was sound asleep. He crawled in quietly. And she turned, still sleeping, so that she curled up against him. And he did not press that advantage. The very next morning, Prince Paris came in from the wild. He was combed, and he was bathed, and he was questioned. And everyone who met him fell in love with him. How, like a Greek, is this Trojan? Menelaus introduced Prince Paris to his wife. Oh, Helen, Helen, I think you will like him. He reminds me of you. And then there was a skirmish in the Great Hall. And so he dismissed himself, leaving the two to introduce themselves. Well, when Paris saw Helen, he just simply stared because a memory was flirting at the back of his mind. And she stared too, for the hairs upon her flesh were slowly beginning to stand as if Aphrodite herself was blowing down the back of her neck. Do I know you? He remembered his manners. No, I, I do not think that you do. <gasps> yes. Many remembered. Uh, to kiss her hand and both their bodies woke. Menelaus returned to sweep his wife and his guest into the feast. And the very next day, his brother Agamemnon came. We must hide out of Minos. Our grandfather is dead, and we must practice funereal rites. Come, Menelaus, we must quickly depart. And Menelaus made quickly to depart to go with his brother Agamemnon, and he found Helen in their bedchamber to say his goodbyes. Oh, I am so glad you are loyal to your family, she said to him. No, Helen, no, this temper is untimely. No, if it were another matter, I might stay, but I will not ignore my ancestors' funereal rites. No, no, I, I, am, I am glad that you must go. You turned from me. Not I from you. Yes, Menelaus, I did. For you took me as a dog will take a bone for appetite, and then wondered why I did not beg to be drooled upon him. I carry you like a hook in my mouth. Oh, yes, yes. You covet my curves. You swell at the sound of my melodious voice. You want to be wanted by me so that you can boast about what you have caught. Yeah. 
weaponless, snowless. Once again. Departed from his wife. And Helen. Watched him. Yes, go, go. You fly as you will. While I sit and sit and sit upon this nest. That night in the tapestry room, she looked clearly at what her mother was weaving. The swan mother. This, yes, yes, isn't it beautiful? The black beak and the black eyes. The swan mother. Who was the swan? <laughs> Don't you know? You've never told me directly. Everyone mocks me and they say that I'm the daughter of Zeus. But you are the daughter of Zeus, my dear. They don't say it to mock you. They say it in awe. Your blood flows with the immortal blood of the king of Olympus himself, my darling. Mother, I thought I was an animal. A swan. That is why you gave me to Theseus, and Theseus abandoned me. Zeus, his daughter, true? Zeus, his daughter, true? And I am not a swan. swan that flies. Oh, Helen, my darling daughter, be careful what you do. Do, mother, I do not do. I am only done to. And with that, Helen of Zeus flew from her mother's room. That night she dreamed of of, of, of ships and, and swans and, and woke sweating and, and launched herself to the open window, looking up at the stars, looking to a long, long, distant mountain capped in white. Zeus, father, what would you have of me? My mother sits at the loom, weaving fantasies from my face. And just at that moment, a star leapt across that black velvet sky pointing the way to the ship at harbor, waiting for that prince of Troy. Yes. Yes, I see it. But now the ship waits for him, so that he may come and go as he pleases. Oh, I would that I were him. Zeus's daughter flashed with an idea. She took a knife to that long flaxen hair, cut it, and let it fall. An oarsman found her on that ship destined for Troy below deck, wretching there in the hold. She was dressed as Polydeuces, and her hair cut short, her skin stained, so he knew her not for a woman, and he simply pulled the stowaway up. And Prince Paris seeing, Polydeuces, you did not need to hide. I would have gladly welcomed you upon my chin. Men, I will pay you better if you row swiftly. Then he remembered. When he was a young shepherd there on Mount Ida, dreaming there upon soft green slopes, an apple had fallen at his feet, glimmering as if it were gold. He lifted the apple to take a bite, but saw words to the fairest, and there appeared Mercury, Zeus's messenger, with his winged heel saying, hmm, you have to pick. And was gone. Pick what? Oh. Immediately appearing before him were three 
goddesses. Naked goddesses, Hera, the wife of Zeus, and Athena with the flashing green eyes, and then Aphrodite herself, the goddess of love and beauty. It wasn't fair. She leaned into his arm. <laughs> he handed her the apple. Paradise. Your reward. There is in the world a girl who is almost as fair as I. When you find her, when you join with her, then I shall bring you into my realm. Her name's Helen. Helen. The look in his eyes went straight through Helen. No, 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 this is not what I wanted. No, this, no, no, and this is not what I intended. No, in panic, she jumped ship into the Aegean. And then Paris just jumped ship after her. And the oarsmen, they all just threw the anchor to wait and watch. Was that little island born at that moment by Poseidon? scooping up that soft sea. Helen swam clear of the crushing rocks. Paris swam quickly up behind her. Seeing him, she began to pull herself up to run, but he grabbed a hold of her ankle. He said, no, 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 don't run for me, don't run for me. But she pulled and she pulled, let me go, let me go, no, please, don't. Don't run from me. He, he gained advantage and he, he held her firmly, not hard, but firm, and said, Why? Why? Why do you run from me? Stop. And she said, I run. I run. I run. I run from my face. Raised by the shepherds, the king's own, eager, taught the way of patience. He just simply sat. And Helen, at last, covered that face and opened into weeping. When she was Empty. She rose up and looked at him, and they kissed as if they were born for kissing. And Aphrodite smiled. Ah, oh, blue sky, a weave of soft cloud, and a pair of happy gulls. Calling, calling, calling. Wild Paris did not turn the ship around. Helen of Helen did not ask. In the Trojan throne room, King Priam paced. What were you thinking? What is a pact, you know? Do you know of the pact? All the Greek Trojan warriors are all vowed for her protection. What were you thinking? King Priam, do not fault your son for this act of mine. I hid myself willingly upon his ship. And why, asked the king, only women will understand why I do what I do. <laughs> and they will not all judge me wise. Hecuba, King Priam said to his wife. She rose up and she took her husband's hands. Oh, she's from Sparta, dear. <laughs> and she led Helen aside to speak in private. Oh, Helen, when I was young and first married, I too 
choked on the yoke of marriage. But then that plow broke open my earth and brought forth children, many children. <coughs> when you bear children, you will understand how to stay. And in staying, you will understand that you no longer want to leave. I am not childless. You intend to return. How will my son Paris's heart fare when you leave him too? I, I did not intend to fall in love with your son. It overtook us like an ocean swell. Oh, yes, yes with emotion, as you were swelled with emotion when you left a husband who angered you. Oh, and you were so calm, were you? When you pulled the infant Paris from your nipple and threw him out to Mount Ida to die? Prophecy, have you never felt the burn of prophecy on the night before Paris was born? I dreamed, I dreamed that he would set Troy aflame The advisors took him and threw him out to Mount Ida while I was sleeping. Forgive me, great queen. I speak swiftly, not knowing what I say. Do you still believe the prophecies? Prophecies, prophecies. There is a beast of war between the Greeks and the Trojans fed by long years of mistrust and greed. The god of war is a cunning navigator. When we are most swelled with emotion, that is when he steals our rudders and aims us toward his bloody purpose. No, no, war is made for men and women. Be wise. We love our warriors, and we hate the death of our sons. And in this, we stay ever confused, and we hide behind the walls, saying, war is men's business. Helen, Helen, I do not fault you either. Find the answer that your heart seeks, but if you can, please go home. And soon, Helen, try to go home soon. When is soon, soon enough? The day before the day when you can no longer leave. Helen loved Troy, and Troy loved Helen, and the Paris prophecies were all forgiven in the beauty of the match until she filled with Paris's child, and now she began to walk along that Trojan wall, looking out on that blue Aegean, wondering if or should Menelaus come relieved, she imagined him, free of my critical back and my harsh tongue. Surely, surely I was. The child quickened within. And she swelled with memory <coughs> of three other children. I love them all. My heart, flesh, medium day. Perhaps only the gods can come and go to love without scars.
in the Mycenae throne room. Agamemnon argued with his brother Menelaus. No, no, Agamemnon, I do not want to take Troy. I only want to bring Helen home. Oh, oh. Only a fool would chase the wind. I should have gone when first she departed. No, no, a taste of war will tame her. You are too hot, Agamemnon. I will have her home. I will take Odysseus with me, and I will bring her home. Oh, I hope you fail. I need this oath of Tyndareus. Trade does not inspire soldiers, Menelaus. You know this. Soldiers need a face worth fighting for. I will pray that you fail. Menelaus went with Odysseus, and they were welcomed in to the Trojan throne room, where they were feasted according to the laws of hospitality. Three days, one to rest, another to discuss, and the third day to decide. Menelaus with Odysseus with him, Odysseus of the clever tongue. They sent a messenger boy back and forth uh, to Helen. Uh, 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 <clears throat> Uh, tell Helen, said Menelaus, tell Helen that I invite her home. Uh, tell her that I do not fault her for leaving. The messenger boy went back and he came back and she said, Oh, she, she says that she will, she, she will come if you will leave her a ship, just like you trusted that prince of Troy with a ship. Tell her that I, that I, no, don't say Agamemnon's name. Hates my brother. Tell her that I would send a ship for her or leave one if I owned the time, but we do not own the time. <coughs> Helen says that grapes plucked unripened make bitter wine. <laughs> Oracles. <laughs> Odysseus, what means my sphinx? Oh, well, <clears throat> Penelope is always very loath to travel too when she is carrying my child. Carries Paris' child. Go see if this is true. And the messenger came back and said, yes, 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 this is true. And King Brian stood there and said, oh, well, then. We will raise the coming prince of Troy. Go home, Menelaus, and grieve the wife that you have lost. If I go home without Helen, Agamemnon will launch. Well, then just let him launch. The ships. Menelaus is gathered on his brother Agamemnon's request. One thousand ships in the Eobian Straits, the long straits docked. Each ship with a hundred men. All the suitors came because of their vow. Great Ajax, and little Ajax, best in spear throwing, and beautiful Palamedes, and wise Nestor, and even Achilles, the unmatchable hero with the vulnerable heel. He brought his cousin Patroclus. But you will not fight. Even Odysseus came, he was very loath to leave Penelope. But he too, we couldn't imagine why, had stood upon a bloody horse. In Troy, Helen walked the wall, watching and waiting, waiting. There must must come ship. There must come ship. And then she delivered a 
prince. To a prince. plan now. I know why you must go. I know you are but a bird that but rests within my tree. I would that I had been your first. One thousand ships docked in the Yogian Strait. And no wind, no wind to depart, no wind and distress and Agamemnon at last persuaded against his pride to an oracle, the god Apollo, driver of the wind and master of Music and sun and prophecy. Give me the winds so that I might depart. War is not made for men of heart. What will you sacrifice for it? Sacrifice, I've given you all. I've, what is it that you wish from me? Mm. Will you sacrifice your daughter? If a denial. For that I make men known is the only thing that lives truly in your heart. If a denial. I make known. The square jaw. Bloody-handed Agamemnon went to war without wind, for the sacrifice shocked even the gods. The wind held its breath, and the sea went still, and so it was with only human muscle that Agamemnon led his ships to Troy for war while Helen walked the wall and watched and watched for one ship but they did not send. Pride stands impenetrable as our wall. We will humble these Greeks pissing in our harbor, and then, then you can decide whether you want to stay or go. For my part, I think Paris a fine match for you. Is there no wind that will blow back your warriors? <sighs> my warriors are my wind. The two armies charge at each other. They threw their spears and their voices and their bodies and their chariots again and again and again and again. How long 
was that first encounter as they backed away to renew, to press on again and again as two bulls will do, equal in a rut. How slowly they let that thought form equal. No, each side bred upon the lie that their enemy will fall like a leaf to a brittle wind. No, no, we are not equal. We are stronger. And so again, they would shield their bodies and they would cry out with their spears and their swords and their voices and their chariots again and again and again and again until at last the blood and the death was louder than their will and they realized at last that this will not be quick. And so they beached their ships, the Greeks, and the Trojans hunkered up behind their wall and they buried their dead as was the laws of war and they burned their sacrifices each to their gods and waited for spring the season of war to begin again for another year of war another year of war, and another year of war, and another year of war, and yet another year of war. The predator birds grew thick, well fed upon that war plate. In the ninth year, News came from Sparta that King Tyndareus died, and the two brothers, Polydeuces and Castor, had sought their own deaths, and Zeus had taken them and planted them as Gemini in the night sky, making Menelaus now king. My rights have changed, Agamemnon. My rights have changed. We will call a truce. And I shall meet Paris, man to man, alone. And when I win, I will take Helen home. Paris handed his helmet to Helen. Helen, shall I win for you or die for you? I would have you live for our son. But I would not have Menelaus die for him. The Greeks and the Trojans made a circle arena with their bodies, and the royals and Helen all watched from the top of the Trojan wall. They were equally matched, but Paris's gift was bow and arrow not spear and hand, and besides, Menelaus was used to killing. Paris had been very shy anymore. They fought long before Paris fell, and when Menelaus removed the helmet to expose the neck for the killing blow, a fog rushed up from the water, and the chin strap oddly broke. And then Paris raised a shepherd, did what any creature would do when happy accident frees it from the predator's jaw, Paris rose up and ran, disappearing into the mist, and Menelaus let loose a spear which landed bloodless in the ground, and the Greeks cried out, coward, and the roar of the war awoke as if it had never been paused. But now the war was within as well as without. The Trojans fought and railed against each other, against this accusation of cowardice. Hector, the mightiest, the eldest son, the greatest warrior of all Troy, railed and railed against his brother. And in the Greeks, there among the Greek tents, Agamemnon finally offended Achilles so greatly that the unmatchable hero cooled his heels in his tent and refused to fight. King Priam became moved by 
by this time. Even now, even now, word has come that Hector has made it all the way to the killing fields. Hector, your bright, shining star, our sun, is high in his honor and has set the Greek ships aflame. Let us press this advantage and send me to Menelaus. Yes, he will bring all his men and he will bring Achilles and Achilles will bring everyone else and then we will be done. Oh, no, 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 they will gut you like a sheep. I am Zeus's daughter. I cannot die. Let me go. The fury of sound brought them to the edge of the wall. And they could see it was true. The Greek ships, many, were ablaze. And a hurricane of men was spewing from Achilles' ships. And a bloody soldier broke into the king. Priam, Priam, Achilles comes. Achilles comes. No, no, Achilles can't come. Achilles has sworn that he will not fight. No, no, you don't understand. His cousin Pactolus stole Achilles' armor. And wearing that matched our Hector blow for blow. Hector killing him thought that he killed Achilles himself. Achilles, the news of the death of his cousin, rose once more. Hector! The Trojans buried themselves behind the wall. The Greeks backed up and watched as Hector and Achilles met alone. And Achilles killed Hector. But his fury was not spent. Achilles tied Hector to the back of his chariot and dragged him around the Trojan Wall for three long days. And Paris in earnest now, against all the railing, watched like a cold-eyed hawk with his best bow and arrow in his hands. And when at last the feet lined up, Paris let loose the arrow that pierced Achilles' heel. Achilles fell as the oak tree will fall to Zeus's lightning. But yet, but yet it did not end. A Greek rose up to avenge Achilles, and he had Heracles, the famous Hercules, Heracles' own bow. Prophecy had spoke of its power, and he took that, and he let loose a bevy of arrows to Paris on the wall, gutting him here in his stomach and his shoulder and his neck. Helen held him as the bloody breath gurgled in the back of his throat, held him until his pain-filled eyes filled with peace, and held him until the sun granted warmth in his blood, left his body, held him until his skin Diphobus, the third born son of Troy, took his rights. Hector, Paris gone. All is mine, including Paris's beautiful wife. Helen tried to throw herself off the wall, but he caught her up and took her to his chambers to force her to submission. When he was finished, he put himself up on his elbow. He, he looked at Helen, thinking that he had pleased her. You touch me not. I have known men. Helen pulled herself up on her 
himself on the weight of his body and washed herself in the bath, pressing the tender bruises and joined the women again in the art of weaving. Agamemnon's tent, the two brothers argued again. Menelaus, I need your men. And the grief cries from Achilles' tent floated about them like smoke on the dying fire. Odysseus watched the young look of the two brothers once more. <laughs> Only now, Menelaus, the elder brother looks to the younger. What you've always wanted. No, Odysseus, no. Stop your tongue. I do not like this horse. Treachery. Warriors hiding within a horse like Serpents in a, in, a, in, a, in a in no, there is no honor in it. No, I will bring my men. I will wait until the gates are open, and then we will raise our swords for one thing only: the safe return of my queen, brother. All is lost unless I win. Yes, I hope you find it worth. placed it in the center of the killing fields, and they sent a storyteller. Oh, yeah, look at that. That's pretty big. It's, a, it's an offering for Athena. Of course it's an offering for Athena. It's a horse. <laughs> yeah, they built it big. Now, if you look at it, it's, it's so big. <gasps> they did not want you to bring it in. That's it. They built it so big that you would not bring it in because I think, I think the horse is there to protect them for their trip home, yeah? And if you bring it into the city, then they'll all die on their way home. And they all went down, those Trojans went down, and they grabbed that horse. And they pulled that horse in, blood pumped by mastering the impossible. We've won, they said. They looked at the wall, and sure enough, the Greeks had taken to their ships and burned their structures and were tail between their legs, gone. They thanked all the gods. They opened all the leftover wine. They sang, they danced, they dared to make love again. For now they believed in the hope of children. And when at last they were all asleep, the storyteller uh, uh, <laughs> went up to the wall and And I went down and opened the latch on the Trojan horse. And ten warriors slipped out and killed the guards and opened the Trojan walls. And the Greeks flooded that city. Whipped by ecstasy and bloodlust into carnage and gore. Horrible. Priam, dead. All the sons and daughters of Priam dead. All the princelings and princesses gutted and <coughs> dead. But for the elder princesses, put among the women, spare for use of the conquerors. And so they were tented on the beach, the Trojan women huddled, cowed by trauma 
and Queen Hecuba stood looking at Troy burn. The blood of her family stained her robes, dried to the color of rust. She just tore at her hair and moaned, and Helen stood by to protect the queen, and the Greeks sent their messengers to grab up their uh, division there. There To take them back on the ships. And now and again, a Trojan woman passing Helen spat in her face. But she took it. Because at long last, she knew that she was not her face. And she knew how badly they needed to spit. Finally, she was alone. So she found a tent and took refuge there, and falling asleep. She woke to his voice, Helen. 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 He came himself. She wiped herself as best she could, and she came out from the tent and looked at him, and he said nothing. They simply stared at each other for a long time, his red hair had streaks of white in it, and his skin had gone graveled with great lines. At last she found words. She said, King of Sparta, will you take me as your slave then? I did not want this war. I should have sent a ship. Right away, I should have sent a ship. But Agamemnon, Agamemnon lives. He is my brother, but I am no longer held by his will, Helen. Envied him. <laughs> Menelaus, Paris envied you. No, why? I never owned your heart. No, no. You, I, I was trying to come. You, you, what? I was trying to come. What? You're not listening, Menelaus. I was trying to come home. And with that, Menelaus of Mycenae, king of Sparta, fell upon his knees. Helen, for these ten years I have whipped myself for never understanding that you are not to be old. <coughs> my Surrendered that heart to his queen. And she arranged herself so she would not fall to this new balance, and the moonlight had now come and was playing upon those red curls. And she took her fingers and she combed her hands into those curls which were soft. Menelaus had taken a bath. <laughs> <laughs> Helen's gates opened in a rush. When the messenger came,
came from the ship, worried about his king's delay, he said that he found the two, the king and the queen, knee to knee, there in the sand, deep in conversation. He, he wondered what they were saying to each other. I wonder what they said to each other. But at long last, the king rose, and he helped his queen to rise until they were standing eye to eye. And Helen said, husband, it is time to go home. And Menelaus answered, yes, wife, it is. And he offered her his arm, and she took it. And then they walk slowly toward the ship, along those shores, watched by a multitude of curious stars, and gazed upon by a forgiving